the spoof movie, a genre that has achieved some of the highest highs and some of the lowest lows. A deceptively difficult genre to get right, to recreate the tropes of a more serious film or genre in a way that points out something silly about those tropes, with enough cartoony gags to keep it really silly, but not so many that you lose all sense of grounding. While there are many spoof movies I love, there is one that stands above the rest for me despite not necessarily doing everything right. Today, I'm talking top secret. Dave's Obsession, Dave's Obsession of the Moment. Top Secret is my favorite spoof movie, and I'm not alone. Weird Al Yankovic has said it's his favorite movie, period, and he's borrowed a few gags from it over the years. I was young and get married, but I'd rather clean all the bathrooms in Grand Federal Station with my tongue. Top Secret was made by David Zucker, Jim Abrahams, and Jerry Zucker after Kentucky Pride movie, Airplane, and the Police Squad TV series, but before the Naked Gun movies, and it was not the hit that Airplane and the Naked Gun movies are, but I honestly love it the most out of all of them, and it's hard to pinpoint why. I mean, it's easy to say I think it's the funniest out of all of them, but that's such a subjective and intangible thing that it actually got me wondering if I can pinpoint specific reasons I love Top Secret even more than Airplane and Naked Gun. If you haven't seen Top Secret, I'm gonna spoil a lot of the best gags here, so I recommend watching it first. As of this recording, it's free on Pluto TV, and it has significantly fewer jokes that have aged poorly than you'd expect from the era. I also recommend watching it because the actual premise of the movie is hard to explain beyond it's a really funny spoof. Like, the story kinda meanders. An American rock star is invited to play an East German music festival, which is basically being put on as a distraction from, you know, Nazi stuff that they're doing. The American rock star falls in love with a girl who turns out to be a member of the resistance. He gets arrested, meets the girl's imprisoned father. He's released long enough to perform his concert. He escapes with the girl after the concert. He meets up with the resistance. The leader of the resistance turns out to be the girl's long lost ex. They need the rock star's help to infiltrate the prison. The leader of the resistance turns out to be a traitor not exactly summarizable in an elevator pitch. And the filmmakers blame the relative lack of success on the lack of a coherent story. I think one of our problems was that we ended up just trying to connect all these scenes together and the plot didn't really have its own inertia. It, didn't, it, it, it wasn't a good story if you remove the jokes, whereas uh, if you look at Airplane, um, although it's not an innovative story, it is a classically plotted and structured film. And I think that was a, a big difference between those two movies. And I think Top Secret has, in fact, many more jokes in it probably than Airplane. But Airplane had a stronger story. But, like, I think the movie still works. I don't think the overly complicated story makes the film any less enjoyable. I enjoyed the second and third Pirates movie for crying out loud. A complicated story is not a deal breaker for me. In fact, I think it serves the spoof of World War II espionage thrillers to make the story so convoluted. And I don't think a clearer story would have made the movie more marketable, but maybe a clearer genre target would have? I guess we were thinking, wouldn't it be fun if Elvis Presley was in a World War II movie? Is that what we were thinking? It's mostly a spoof of World War II movies, with plot elements largely drawn from The Conspirators, Casablanca, and The Great Escape, and even a sequence that evokes Raiders of the Lost Ark. But the main character is plucked right out of Elvis movies and other teen pop star movies, with a music video that throws back to Frankie and Annette, and a concert that evokes the Beatles on Ed Sullivan, and... That's a mashup premise that might not immediately hook a potential audience and it might be an even harder sell today after certain other spoof movies that purport to parody a specific genre have often been criticized for randomly throwing in reenactments of completely different genres, even though that's the least of those movies' problems, but I've ranted about Seltzerberg plenty before. But the thing is, in the case of Top Secret, the genres don't really matter that much to the final film. This isn't really a film with a take on World War II movies or Elvis movies. You know, like, Blazing Saddles has a real take on westerns. It has a genuine affection for the aesthetics, but real criticism of the bigotry inherent in the genre. Walk Hard and Weird have real takes on the musician biopic. They make fun of the genre's absurd heightening of history and falsification of facts. The closest thing Top Secret has to a take is 
Wouldn't an Elvis protagonist be a silly main character for a war movie? So what makes this movie work isn't the premise, it's all in the execution. And a big part of the execution is the incredible cast. Long before you would play Jim Morrison, Val Kilmer's very first on-screen role is this film's rock god, Nick Rivers. True to the Zazz style, he's playing it straight, but due to the particular type of role he's spoofing here, he has a different energy than Leslie Nielsen does playing it straight. It's not the same kind of stoic deadpan, it's an earnest enthusiasm and he nails it. Kilmer even worked hard to learn guitar and was rather annoyed when the directors thought it would be funnier if he just strummed poorly. I wonder if this anecdote was in the back of Weird Al's mind when he was giving Daniel Radcliffe his accordion lesson. The leading lady is Hilary Flamond, played by the effortlessly charming Lucy Gutteridge, and given the amount of Casablanca in the script, I suspect she may have been cast in part due to her slight resemblance to Ingrid Bergman. Her imprisoned father is Michael Goh, long before he and Kilmer would reunite at Wayne Manor, and Nick's manager is Billy J. Mitchell, a character actor I've pretty much only ever seen play Americans in things that were filmed in England. This guy Wooster, where is he? I could not say, sir. He sneaked my son's dog. Didn't you used to be Eddie Valiant? No, that's it, Ross. Put it to bed. Right? What are you standing around here for? I'm not. We also have a supporting role in the first act of the movie from legendary legend Omar Sharif, who basically spends his free time suffering indignity after indignity, and we have an even smaller cameo later from legendary legend Peter Cushing, who... Well, we'll get to that later. But Zucker, Abraham, Zucker are no strangers to taking a great cast and making them do silly nonsense. What does this film have that the others don't? Well, one thing is the soundtrack. Not only the score from legendary legend Maurice Jarre reuniting with legendary legend Omar Sharif, but the songs of Nick Rivers himself, which are all catchy as hell. The first one we hear is not only the funniest song of the movie, it's one of the funniest comedy songs I've ever heard. Everybody had a 12 gauge and a support too. The idea of skeet surfing came from a game the Zazz team played amongst themselves where they would try to get the most ridiculous lie they could into print whenever they were interviewed. And, and they said, what do you guys do in Southern California? And I think that was the origin said, of surfing. Well, skeet, skeet surfing. Skeet surfing. Where you, you ride on. And so we explained the whole thing. And at the end, we just were waiting for the guy to say, come on, this is, you know. It's ridiculous, but he said, how do you keep the powder dry or something? <laughs> yeah, how, do you, how do you keep the gun dry? Now, according to the liner notes of the limited edition soundtrack CD from La La Land Records, Skeet Surfin' was actually written by Mark Volman and Howard Kalin of The Turtles and Flo and Eddie. But since it was deemed by the lawyers that the melodies came too close to the original Beach Boys tunes, the only songwriters credited in the movie are Brian Wilson, Mike Love, and Chuck Berry. I wish they all could be double barrel. Wish they all could be double barrel guns. And of course, a Beach Boys pastiche focusing on gunplay is another gag Weird Al would go on to borrow. Now I'm trigger happy, trigger happy every day. The next song we hear Nick perform is the only straight cover in the movie. While they didn't put any jokes in the lyrics, the scene is still really funny. The culture clash going on, the look of horror in the face of the Mater D and the singer who was supposed to perform, it's classic deflating the high society Margaret Dumont stuff. Difference is, most of the high society is actually won over by Nick and... Yeah, wouldn't you be? This man is a rock star. You'd be forgiven for assuming that this scene was in part spoofing the Johnny B. Good scene from Back to the Future, except Top Secret came out a year before Back to the Future. Bob, Bob, it's Marvin. Your cousin, Marvin Zemeckis? You know that new scene you're looking for? The next couple of songs aren't quite laugh out loud hilarious in and of themselves, but they're all perfect pastiches. How silly can you get? Yeah, yeah. How silly can you get? How Silly Can You Get, written by former Culture Club keyboardist Phil Pickett, is the classic Sorry for Cheating on You Diddy, and it gets stuck in my head at least once a week. Baby, please, baby, please, baby, please, spend this night with me. Spend This Night With Me, written by the Zazz team with Mike Moran, is the classic I'm So Desperate For You I Can't Live Without You ballad, with visuals to match. Don't you understand I'm losing, losing my very mind? I gotta have you with me. Then there's Are You Lonesome Tonight, a parody of the song that's been recorded by countless artists, including Elvis Presley himself, rewritten as a Macy's ad. Are you lonesome tonight? Is 
your kitchen a sight? Is your wardrobe all run down there? Finally, there's Straighten Out the Rug, the classic get out on the floor dance number with some more specific literal instructions and as much energy as you could possibly want. You gotta straighten the rug. Yeah, straighten the rug. You gotta give it a push. Yeah, give it a shove. If all this movie gave me was the soundtrack, I would be forever appreciative for that. Of course, there's not just songs. There's all the types of jokes you'd expect from Zazz. Slapstick. Terrible puns made literal. I know a little German. He's sitting over there. People suffering for other people's clumsiness. It is a magnetic mind. So powerful, it will attract itself to submarines miles away. How about that? Oh, no! Idiots misunderstanding each other. The traitor in our mists. Well done, La Trim. I see you have dealt with him appropriately. Dick jokes. The filmmakers have said this is less of a movie than a joke book, and I can't quite argue with that, but the jokes in the movie are good enough to elevate it. But there's a type of gag that's used more in this movie than in any other Zazz film. It's hard to categorize, and by even trying to put a label on it, I'm probably dissecting way too many frogs here, but for lack of a better phrase, I'm calling these cinematic wordplay. I don't mean visual puns, although, again, there are plenty of those. I mean gags that play with the language of cinema. Gags that play a joke on our expectations of what we're even observing based on how we know these things work in movies, turning what we think we're seeing and hearing on its head. The setups are so innocuous that you don't even think they're things you can make a joke out of, and then you're blindsided by a punchline you didn't even know was possible. There's one notable prototype of this sort of joke in Airplane, the mirror gag. Just unbelievable. How many times have I warned those people about food inspection? You'd think after all these years, someone would listen to me. Oh, well, airport management, the FAA, and the airlines. Oh, cheats and liars. All right, let's get out of here. And Zaz seemed dissatisfied at how it went over. This is the famous mirror scene. That yes, I, no, I don't know if anybody really got it, but... It, it didn't get a laugh, but it was bizarre. Yeah. So excited. So we decided to take that concept and expand it into Top Secret. But I'm glad they doubled down on them in Top Secret because they're my favorite jokes in the movie, and I think they elevate the movie to a level of brilliance unsurpassed by any other spoof. So, okay, I'm going to showcase some of these gags, and I realize that out of context they won't hit as hard because part of what makes them work so well is you're not expecting a gag. So, seriously, if you haven't watched the movie, yet, just stop this video, go watch the movie first. Okay, so first some of the simple examples. Using a common force perspective prop to create a common force perspective illusion, and then immediately breaking that illusion and drawing attention to the force perspective prop. So simple, but so effective. You know what a binocular border looks like, you think it's overlaid in post or it's on the camera lens itself, but nope, it's physically there and the cows interact with it. Again, simple but effective. I guess I could have called these optical illusion gags, except they're not all visual. Audio is played with just as effectively. Nick, I'm sorry I won't be able to join you for dinner tonight. Like, based on everything we know about cinematic language, we know that hearing an echoey voice while we watch someone read something means that what we're hearing is what he's reading. And then the entire joke is that what we know we're seeing isn't actually what we're seeing. I'm coming down with a sore throat, so I've decided to turn in early. Don't forget, you have to be at the theater at 8.30. And then they even provide an in-universe character-driven reason for the guy to be talking like this. A hilariously stupid reason, but one with internal logic for the character. <laughs> This doesn't help at all. Then there's not only my favorite bit of cinematic wordplay in the movie, but possibly my favorite visual gag in cinema history. Because the first three times I watched the movie, I kept forgetting about this and it caught me off guard every time. Der Zug jetzt am 
Gleis 3 steht. It's so effective. You have absolutely no reason to believe you're not seeing the train pull out of the station until the very last second. Even if you can somehow tell that the train itself is still, your brain just thinks, oh, it's like rear projection or something, but no. <laughs> and even though it doesn't surprise me anymore, I am still in awe of the craft of this gag. It's like riding the Haunted Mansion. I know how the tricks work, they don't surprise me, but I still have so much respect for them that I enjoy pretending to be fooled. I think it's not only how effective the optical illusion is that kills me about this, it's how elaborate the setup is for such a stupid idea. Plus there's the tag that continues to give the idea the illusion of a consistent internal logic, even if it's one that makes no sense in reality. <laughs> And speaking of elaborate, there's the Peter Cushing scene, which starts with a simple enough optical illusion. <clears throat> And by simple enough, I mean they had to make a head cast of Peter Cushing so they could sculpt that fake guy. And then years later, that head cast was digitally scanned to create the CGI Grand Moff Tarkin in Rogue One. I have mixed feelings about that Tarkin, but uh, I do think it's very fun that this movie is responsible for part of a Star War. But the core gag of the scene is that they're speaking what sounds to an uneducated American audience like Swedish. Except then it turns out they're just talking backwards. And as the scene goes on, you find out that the whole thing is backwards. And everybody has a different point where they first notice the trick happening until they just make it blatantly explicit at the end. And it's like, surprise, we did all of that in reverse for you. Again, just the elaborate painstaking craft that went into the silliest of ideas. Apparently the song title, How Silly Can You Get, was a personal challenge the filmmakers set for themselves. And yes, this backward scene was homaged by Weird Al. Of course, in his version, he let you know right away it was backwards. Some other spoof movies have a few cinematic wordplay gags like this, but I haven't found one with as high a concentration of them as Top Secret, and they're part of what makes this movie so much more special to me than other spoofs. Of course, it's also possible I love Top Secret more than Airplane and Naked Gun because it's more underexposed, so it's not nearly as overquoted which means that if I succeed in spreading its gospel, it'll lose some of its appeal for me. Ah, whatever, it's a sacrifice I'm willing to make if it means more people can experience the joy. As a spoof movie, Top Secret is not a particularly unique recipe, it just has some really great ingredients that elevate the whole thing, and it's good silly fun. But enough about me, what spoof movie is your favorite? Let's discuss this in the comments, and if you liked all my asides about Weird Al and my thoughts on spoof movies in general, you might like this video I made last year ranking Al's movie theme songs. And if you want to hear me babble about other things I like, you might enjoy this playlist of other obsessions of other moments. And until next time, this is Dave, signing off.